everyone. My name is Elsie Nunn, and I'm the Executive Director of Project Learn. And I'm so thrilled to welcome you to our second annual fundraiser, where the theme is Learn Today, Lead Tomorrow. We're here tonight to celebrate the accomplishments of Lowell young people and hear from, directly from students who've benefited from Project Learn programs. Programs like Early College Lowell, which offers the opportunity for Lowell High students to earn college credit before graduation at no cost to them or their families. And Idea Camp, which offers summer STEAM program workshops for, student, for students at Lowell Public Schools that helps prepare them for careers in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. We have so many people to thank for helping make tonight possible, including our phenomenal hardworking staff, Shamir Rivera Quintal, Jordan Elliott, Martha Cohen, and Katerine Patino. Our incredible board of directors, advisory board and associate board, and of course, our sponsors, without whom tonight wouldn't be possible. Our premier sponsor, C.L. Donahue, Titus Plomeritis, Enterprise Bank, Eversource, and the Demoulis Foundation. Our platinum sponsors are Covanta and Sunrun. Our gold sponsors are Gallagher and Kavanaugh, Eastern Bank, and Align Credit Union. Our silver sponsors, Middlesex Community College, Jean d'Arc, Lowell Sun Charities, Brian and Elise Martin, Delaney and Associates, Get There, Start Now, Travellini, Scorzoni, and Kylie. And our bronze sponsors are Martin Insurance Company, Edward Crockett and Alicia Nimi, and Lowell Community Charter Public School. It's our donors and sponsors who really help make big things happen. When schools closed suddenly last spring, many students went home without their school supplies. Project Learn launched a COVID-19 supplies fund, which raised nearly $5,000. And we partnered with Lowell Public School staff to deliver books, school supplies, and enrichment activities to 1,200 kids and families right in their neighborhoods. And when Lowell High's spring internship program dried up due to the pandemic, we were able to quickly pivot and offer a virtual summer internship program, Commencement to Careers, which provided 40 rising seniors and recent graduates who worked remotely with 13 local businesses. This is the kind of magic that your investment creates. At Project Learn, we believe that every student deserves a world-class education. That's why we work hand-in-hand -hand with the Lowell Public Schools to develop innovative programs and services that provide access to inspire today's students and equip them with the knowledge, skills, and mindsets they need to succeed in college career, and life. I feel incredibly fortunate to work with former head of school, former head of Lowell High School, and Project Learn's board chairman, Brian Martin, someone who truly understands what our young people need to succeed today. Brian, I'd like to pass it along to you. Thank you, LZ. Uh, hello, everyone. I've been honored to serve as the chair of the board for the past two years, succeeding John Haley, who was a great chairman and a Lowell High School grad, founder of Watermark. Uh, and uh, after founding the organization with George Duncan from Enterprise Bank and Kendall Wallace from the Lowell Sun, both Lowell High School graduates, by the way, uh, I found that uh, everything we did as, as uh, uh, successful business people and people in the public sector, we constantly came back and talked about the Lowell High School students. Uh, and that's really where uh, Project Learn came from, from low high grads that cared about the community and cared about our students. And I wanted to share just a couple of quick stories uh, that uh, uh, gives me some perspective about Lowell. Uh, I went to a, uh, an event uh, at the Vesper Country Club, which is probably one of the most uh, uh, exclusive golf clubs uh, in Massachusetts. It's right on the Lowell-Tingsboro border. And it was an event for Lowell High School, 
Uh, and I left the event and I was walking out to the parking lot and I came across two students that were low high school seniors who had just had dinner at Vespa Country Club on their parents' uh, membership ticket. And I said to myself, geez, I didn't realize that we had students from low high that belonged to Vespa Country Club. And then the next day I uh, attended a track meet at, low, at the stadium. And one of the students who was running became a great friend of mine and, uh, and uh, was a graduate of Lowell High. His name was Manny Mensa. He was a Ghana uh, immigrant and uh, his family had moved to Lowell. And he was running uh, in a race at the stadium. And I looked at him and I said, Manny, where are your sneakers? And he said, oh, my brother has them. And I said, what do you mean my brother? Has them? We only have one pair of sneakers in our family. Uh, so he's using his sneakers to do the triple jump. And when he's finished, I have to put them on to run the race. And I never forgot that. And when we founded this organization, I said to George Duncan and Ken Wallace that, you know, there are so many uh, students and families in this city that need our help. Uh, and a lot of them don't, but a lot of them do. And I think we should be able to find a way uh, to bring our community together uh, and raise funds for programs uh, that are going to impact our students. Uh, and fast forward to our first major grant uh, for Project Learn, and that was with Verizon Foundation, where we were uh, funded to fit up the makerspace in the Freshman Academy. And soon after, uh, a student named David Nyan, who's now at the University of Mass and Lowell, is an engineering student. He actually created a, a clock out of plastic uh, in the makerspace, and he gave it to me when he left the high school. And I can't think of a, a better way uh, for our graduates of Lowell High to give back to the community to have an impact on some students. That student never forgot that experience. And uh, I think when we see the new high school get constructed and see what the science makerspace is gonna look like in the freshman academy, I think we'll all feel that uh, we're on the right path here to support our students. Uh, and then finally, I just wanted to mention that uh, just this year alone with Project Learn's work, 227 students have participated in Idea Camp and enrolled in, early, in 250 in early college courses. And in the last three years, we've distributed more than 37,000 books to kids and families. So we know that programs like these at Project Learn offers promote access to quality education. And by investing in Project Learn, you are investing in the future of Lowell students. For that, I thank everyone for contributing tonight and giving us some time. But back to you, Elsie. Thank you, Brian. Speaking of Lowell students, next up, I'm honored to introduce you to our student speakers tonight. Lowell High seniors, as they co mc a virtual conversation with Representative Thomas Golden and Lowell High's new head of school, Michael Fiato. Take it away, Maybelline and Jada. Hi, everyone. My name is Maybelline Natoro, and I am a senior at Lowell High School. And my name is Jada Turner. I'm also a senior at Lowell High School, and we're so excited to be interviewing the new head of school of Lowell High School, Mr. Michael Fiato. And State Representative Tom Golden. Good evening, ladies. How are you? Good evening. Good. Everybody. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks. So Jada and I will be taking turns asking you both questions. So first, Mr. Fiato, we'll start with you. I went through Project Learn's Commencement to Careers program and I learned a lot about career development. Things like learning how to build a resume or creating a LinkedIn profile. I also learned transferable skills like how to communicate with the supervisor and how to manage my time, different things like that. So according to you, what are the most important skills a student can leave high school with and why? Well, it sounds like you uh, yourself got a good uh... Uh, background in the critical skills that are going to be necessary to be successful in the 21st century. So you named a couple already. Uh, I also heard you talk about how to set up a LinkedIn account and how to present yourself professionally. Um, some of the things, big picture, what I heard um, in one project that um, uh, Project Learn is very deeply in, engaged with with the high school is the portrait of a graduate work. And we, uh, you, the, the portrait of a graduate surveyed alumni and they responded with resounding um, conviction that uh, there was a few uh, key leadership qualities. And one of them was perseverance. And we found that that was within the, um, 
the program that was from Lowell High School alumni. And what does perseverance mean? And, you know, really being able to stick with things when times get tough, uh, being able to not back down on your core values in the face of adversity. Um, and as any manager or leader, whether you want to be an entrepreneur, uh, you want to be a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, those are very important. That's a very important quality because that, that um, quality of perseverance really impacts other areas within your, uh, within your skill sets. But I would also mention just the ability to collaborate, to listen, to look at, to be able to objectively look at data and make data-driven decisions, but with people at the center and not, um, not just making decisions without, um, you know, the people that you're leading or working with. Um, and, and, and being able to lead in these complex times. These are very difficult times right now, very challenging times. And it's, call, it's calling for new leadership skills and leadership skills that we never really thought we may be called upon under these, um, under, during a global pandemic. So I think that um, perseverance, leadership, collaboration, being able to listen and um, being, uh, being, a hum being humble and just knowing that as a leader, if you wanna be a leader, you have to really accept the fact that you are a servant leader, that you're here to, you're here to help, you're here to make, uh, you know, empower others so that they can do the work themselves. Thank you so much, Mr. Fiato. So our next question is for Representative Golden. So I've worked a lot with Project Learn on social equity, and I've also become a trained facilitator with them. It's something I've become really passionate about, and I've learned the importance of becoming a better listener and how to be patient with other people. So how would you define social justice or social awareness, and how do you think it strengthens a community? Well, first and foremost, I want to say uh, thank you to Project Learn for inviting me here today. I really appreciate it. I appreciated the opportunity for all of, all of us to meet. And unfortunately, due to my work uh, commitments, I was called into Boston. So uh, my background may be a little bit different. So I apologize about that. But um, social justice is something that is extremely important. Uh, we have to first and foremost, we have to believe in what we're, we're talking about. You have to believe as what uh, you've learned, over, I'm sure, over the past uh, few months, um, and you have to clearly identify uh, what those differences and what those rights are afforded to, what should be afforded to all individuals if you feel as though a social justice isn't being afforded to a, a particular uh, subsection of our uh, environment, of, our, of our, the people that we all represent. Uh, the history will always show us that um, from a social justice history, uh, gender, age, sexual orientation, religion, mental status, uh, and race, which is still continuing right now to be um, something of a, of a hot button issue over the past few months. Uh, does that um, mean because of socioeconomics, is there problems within our inner cities or just within our uh, communities as a whole? Uh, tolerance is something that um, is taught, and I think it's extremely important, uh, not just for some, but for all. Uh, but you had mentioned something earlier and it was a key word. Uh, I really uh, honed in on it immediately when you said it, it was listening. I think that if we all uh, took an opportunity uh, or slowed down a little bit and um, to listen to people, listen to what their concerns, is, concerns are, listen to what they believe the social justice issue of today is. Uh, because as I just went through the history, people have fought different social justices uh, throughout the decades and uh, we've come out on the better side for it. I think that uh, when you start to talk about social justice and once again, that key word being listening and people are paying attention to what others are saying, um, I think that's vitally important. It's vitally important for our society. It'll make our uh, society a, a better place to live, a better place to raise our families. And unfortunately um, in today's political climate, I don't know if um, we're leading by example. I don't know if necessarily there's a lot of teaching or, or, or preaching of any tolerance. Uh, sometimes it uh, truthfully reminds me of a heavyweight fight. Uh, you get to your corner, I get to my corner and we come out swinging, uh, you know, whether it be left or right or right or wrong, never really uh, taking the time to find out what that experience is from that person that we may or may not agree with. Uh, so the best thing that we possibly could do, I, I think uh, you've learned, we've learned that already. And the first thing is to, to simply listen to what the concerns are from those folks, uh, from the folks that may have a different opinion than all of us. And I think would, would be a heck of a lot better off if we all, uh, we, if we all adopted that. As, uh, as my mother would say so many times, you have two ears and one mouth, uh, use it appropriately and proportionately. Start listening a heck of a lot more than speaking. Thank you, Representative Golden. So Mr. Fiato, I'm in the early college program at Lowell High. 
And what makes the early college program a little bit different from dual enrollment is that students can earn 15 or more college credits before they actually graduate from high school, which means that they can cash in on those credits when they go to college. So why do you think early college is an important program at Lowell High School? Thank you for that question. And I'm uh, glad to answer it because I think that um, early college here at Lowell High School is probably one of the most important programs that we can run if we do it right. And one of the kind of tenant, one of the main tenets for early college versus dual enrollment is to close that opportunity gap. We often talk about an achievement gap, but I, I look at it, I look at this as an opportunity gap where first generation college going students are the, the targeted primary um, student in an early college program. And we're looking to provide the equity and opportunity. And I also feel this is a social justice issue because when these, these opportunities are open for students, to offer them high quality educational coursework within their high school years where they can amass college credit while they're in high school, saving their themselves and their families lots of money to take that those credits to a community college to be able to get an associate's degree and or a bachelor's degree, save time, save money um, while accessing um, all of the resources within the school and within the community college or the college. And that really sets it apart from a dual enrollment program because early college is designed to provide the level of support. So there are high expectations, but there's also high levels of support. And there should be a component of career success with an early college program so that students are getting exposure and access to various careers through, throughout and, and disciplines throughout their early college experience. So it's not just a set of courses, but it's more of a comprehensive um, experience around career development, um, uh, organizational planning, being able to identify um, uh, career fields by having the opportunity to be exposed to them, wh whether it's an internship or uh, career fairs or a, a mentorship, uh, close contact with the community college. And I, I'm a true believer and right now we have um, uh, a great program at the high school and I, and I love the fact that it's expanding and we wanna push it out where students actually take courses on the college campuses and have that opportunity to take them on the college campus to get that feel for what college looks like. And the results are really promising right now for early college students here, not only in Massachusetts, but across the country. But uh, the, the results are showing that students are completing college and enrolling college at faster rates than their counterparts who don't participate in early college programs. So I think the, the numbers speak for themselves and the results speak for themselves when it's done right. So uh, it's a great, um, wonderful opportunity here at the high school. I'm happy to be a part of it and um, thank, thank, uh, thankful to Project Learn and our other in Middlesex and our other stakeholders for um, supporting us along the way to make it work for, for our students. Thank you so much. And a quick follow up to your answer. What kind of career exposure do you think students will experience if they do pursue the early college studies in high school? Great question. So the, 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 the vision here is that students not only are immersed in the coursework and the be able to receive the um, experience of what it's like to experience college courses. One, if we can get students on college campuses, they can access all of the resources on a college campus, like the career center, the writing center, tutoring labs, have access to the library and all of the resources there. Um, but what we can bring to the school in partnership with uh, community uh, with the community colleges and, the, and our colleges and our community partners is providing career awareness seminars or internships, um, visits to uh, employers to have a career day or um, uh, an, an externship uh, opportunity, um, guest speakers, mentorships. I do believe that internships are critical and it doesn't have to be necessarily be a full year internship, but just to be able to see outside of the, the, the world view that we currently have. And you know, someone once told me, you can't really, you can't dream about something if you don't know it exists. So if you see things, you have a choice to say, you know, I, I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but I didn't realize you had to, you know, operate and see blood. Nope, I don't want to do that. Okay, at least I tried it. Now I can move on to something else. So there's also that process of elimination um, of, uh, but, but we have to expose our, our young people to those opportunities. So that's, um, I think, a critical part of the early college experience and the high school experience in general is having that exposure to careers in real, real time. Thank you so much, Mr. Fiato. So our next question is again for Representative Golden. So you've been a really big supporter of Project Learn's work to bring opportunities to Lowell High students. So I know you believe Lowell could be a model for public-private relationships or partnerships that could create access to 
uh, different jobs, internships, career opportunities for students, and especially in the STEM field. So um, from your perspective, what do you think Lowell can learn from other communities about this topic? Well, uh, you're talking to, uh, I would say one, I'm one of the biggest uh, cheerleaders of the city of Lowell, but I, Brian Martin's here as well. So um, I don't know if I would say that, <laughs> but I'm a big uh, cheerleader of the city. We'll continue to be a, a big cheerleader of the city as a graduate of Lowell High School. Lowell is a leader. Uh, truth of the matter is um, we have a, you know, I work with 159 uh, other representatives throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And many times, uh, more times than not, there are people coming to us saying, hey, how did you do this? How did this happen? Um, how did you guys think of this idea? And it's, uh, it's uh, something that was uh, termed a number of years ago as that can-do attitude, uh, but it really comes back to partnerships. And when I think of partnerships, uh, Lowell is that model and has been that model uh, with innovation pathways programs um, that Project Learn is putting together, whether it be, uh, I think it's environmental sus sustainability, bioscience and health, uh, and health uh, fields. Uh, the early college program, which we just kind of brushed upon just for a moment there. Um, Project Learn has moved forward with uh, the After Dark collaboration, uh, where Lowell High students are getting trained to do web programming and other type of uh, advanced manufacturing sort of the greater Lowell Tech. Uh, and, you know, one of the key parts to that is the partnerships, once again, that are driven throughout uh, uh, the success of the city of Lowell. And Project Learn, Lowell, Lowell Public Schools, Lowell High, uh, Middlesex Community College, they believe in it. And if you, once again, you have to believe in what you're talking about. Um, that's probably one of the biggest pieces we could continue to, uh, to discuss. Uh, so I, I do say this, and I, and I say it with uh, a lot of pride and, um, you know, in a very, very strong statement that the, the city of Lowell um, as a whole does a does a, a darn good job, uh, but we can always get better. But it's uh, it's really talking to uh, young young folks like yourself is how can we get better? How should we be getting getting better? What is it that we're not supplying for the students of tomorrow? Uh, these pathways and partnerships that we've discussed, uh, we have one of the most diverse population student populations in the Commonwealth is right here in the city of Lowell. Uh, the STEM businesses they need to continue to recognize that uh, we have uh, the ingredients for their success. Um, I, was, I was speaking to uh, LZ a little earlier about this, you know, maybe one of the endeavors, and, and I'd love to talk to uh, the young adults about this at a later point in time, maybe we should go up and down uh, a route three to talk about a, a liaison role for somebody over at Project Learn, uh, where we could get the, you know, those big companies like iRobot and uh, Kronos and, and Millipore, uh, Boston Dynamics to see, to let them know the, um, the great student population we have at Lowell, the diverse population, and maybe that's something that we should be talking to students about. Is that something that's going to be exciting for you? Is that something where we could look at those internships that were just mentioned moments ago? Um, so it's a pretty exciting time. And, uh, you know, my uh, theory in all of this is uh, let's get to an idea. Let's not worry about, you know, let's not worry about what it's going to cost right now, but let's try to solve it. Let's try to get to an idea that everyone can, uh, you know, get around and believe in. And once that happens, you know, the city of Lowell has that uh, can-do attitude where we, we, we can get it done. And it's, uh, it's no surprise that Project Learn um, has that can-do attitude and uh, consistently gets it done. Thank you, Representative Golden. And so now my question goes to Mr. Fiato. Um, what piece of advice would you give members of the community who are trying to keep themselves educated on pressing social issues? Boy, that's a that's a tough question for me. I'll be honest with you. I'm having trouble doing that myself and keeping keeping up to date on reliable sources. Uh, I think my advice to myself would be what uh, in terms of the news media, for example, um, what reliable sources can I trust so that I can get a full picture of the facts? Um, and right now, as uh, Representative Golden talked about, sometimes we're in that, we're in that heavyweight match where it's a, it's a he said, she said, we're battling it out, and it's not uh, working to um, any solutions right now. It's a lot of um, hyperbole, and unfortunately, um, we're, we're being blindsided and we're being bombarded with a lot of media um, stories from either social media or some of these news outlets. 
So it's very challenging sometimes to piecemeal what's true and what's not. Um, the other piece is just in terms of time management for, for myself, I find it difficult sometimes to balance, you know, the workload, my work day and my family, and then staying abreast of all of the social issues um, and being uh, updated on it. So for me, the best way to do that is to talk to people is to ask the people what is happening in your life, because I, I, I really, um, you know, I really can get, we can all, we can get wrapped up in a lot of the, um, the craziness that's happening right now in the world and, and not really bring it down, center it to ourselves, our, our families, our communities, our local community. I think that's what we need to focus on right now. Um, as, uh, as we're in a very turbulent time, we have a political election coming up, um, and a little story, you know, I, in terms of my own, I have two, two young people in high school and uh, I was at the, I was on, I was on, um, in the living room on my computer and they all came in the living room and they said, we want to watch the presidential debate. And this is the first time that I, I realized that my kids are involved, interested in politics. I think more young people are interested than we know than we give them credit for. And that was an eye opener for me, for my own, um, even they're my kids. And I was a little blinded by the fact that I, I didn't think they were paying attention, but they are. And um, they watched it and they had feedback for the candidates in both sides. And I, I just thought it was great. So I think we need to um, give more credit and more opportunities for our young people to weigh in on these discussions. But I, I certainly am not a person to say I could give advice to anybody about this because I'm still honestly learning myself. Honestly, I have to get be honest with that answer. Thank you so much, Mr. Fiato. And our next question for Representative Golden is, amidst the, the current pandemic and uncertainty of our lives right now, what message would you like to give the audience? Well, I also wanna say I uh, echo the comments of Mr. Fiato. <laughs> um, you try to give advice and sometimes you need to take it yourself as well. But uh, the first thing that I would have to say, especially uh, with this pandemic, is patience. Uh, and, and you know something, patience is a virtue, and I've heard it so many times, never quite understood it, uh, because I live in a world where, you know, we're up, we're running, we got to go, we got to move, we got to move, and quite frankly, uh, I think with the patient, with patience, you need to learn how to unplug. You have to get away from, you know, social media, I mean, uh, social media or just uh, Zoom and everything else. It's wonderful for me right now because I had no intention of being where I am today, but I can still participate in what, uh, quite frankly, would have been an extremely stressful situation if, um, you know, trying to serve a couple of different masters. But patience is, is, is such a key. It's something that I think uh, we should all try to learn. This pandemic is uh, something that the world has never seen. Uh, but the world, the country has gone through many trying times. I mean, uh, we've been through uh, different world wars, uh, different wars in general. So I think sometimes looking towards our grandparents and finding out how they did it. Uh, we've all had some um, uh, difficulty to bear throughout our lifetime. And I think, although I think this is a lot different, I think this is extremely difficult. Uh, in my 49 short years, I this, uh, pandemic has really thrown a lot of people for a loop. But uh, try to unplug, get back to family, um, you know, and, and, and I hate to say it because I'm using it, but uh, try to unplug from uh, social media and uh, focus on, on what's important. It's your friends, it's your family, and all this other stuff, as uh, was just mentioned a moment ago, you know, you have to check and verify. Uh, where, where years ago, it was deemed to be true because it was on one of the major news stations. Nowadays, uh, you know, just because it's a, the, the big quip is, well, it's gotta be true. I read it on Facebook or, or whatever. Um, and that seems to be true right now. And, and I do lay some fault at uh, some, of the late, some of the larger media outlets for allowing biases to creep into what is the real, what's just tell me the story, tell me what's going on. Uh, we're all educated enough. We're all smart enough to figure out um, where we should go uh, from here. Uh, but patience has got to be the biggest piece because uh, we're not through this uh, pandemic yet. Thank you, Representative Golden. So next up, we actually had a few questions from other students at Lova High. And one of them was for both Rep Representative Golden and Mr. Fiato. So how can student diversity be recognized so that our community is aware and educated on world culture from a younger age? I can yield my 
moment there, Ms. Fiato, if you'd like to go first. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I can. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this, um, but I can talk more from the school side. And I think that uh, as, a, as a society within schools, uh, we just have to, I think we have to examine the curriculum, for example. Uh, does the curriculum represent the diversity of the students that are in front of them every day? And does the, does the, the, the canon of uh, literature reflect um, the young people? And uh, is it relatable? Is it, does it reflect the demographics? Um, is it, do we portray all sides of, 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 of various cultures? Um, I think that's really important because those, those are what, that's what shapes young people. And that's what we have some control over at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at an early age, starting from, you know, starting from preschool all the way through to college. What, is, what are we putting in front of young people? What are we put, putting in front of students as literature, as um, opportunities for, for students to, to, to be critical thinkers and to be able to encourage them to make their own decisions? And um, we, we do have a few classes at the high school that examine race and class. And I think those are great. And I was talking with one of the teachers about how do we infuse this into all classes, these, these topics and conversations. So it's an ongoing conversation. I think, it, it, I think there is a place for it in schools. Um, I think there is a place for it in our communities and society. And as we all recognize that Lowell has a tremendously diverse population, we need to celebrate it. Uh, we recently had, um, this is, uh, we're still in October, we had Hispanic Heritage Month, um, and we we're trying to be creative on how we would put, uh, celebrate that. So we did it on Zoom. We had a, a Zoom, um, was led uh, a Zoom um, meeting with uh, students can log in with their teacher like a virtual field trip. We had guest speakers. And we had uh, student moderators, and it was a great example of how to leverage um, technology in the in the time of social distancing, but still be able to celebrate an important part of our our, our heritage with uh, with uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. And I and I would encourage us to think about other ways to do that um, across various cultures throughout the year and continue to do that. So I think that was a small win because we a big win really because we were able to um, not let the uh, lack of um, being able to be face to face hold us down. And matter of fact, we had a, a, a guest from Florida who, who who was able to log in. And if we were not in a virtual setting, that person wouldn't have been able to join us. So it does have its privileges and benefits to um, be able to um, hold some of these virtually. Okay, thank you so much. And our last uh, question is also for you, Mr. Fiato. And it is, why do you believe, um, sorry, what do you believe is the importance of a student's, me um, a student's mental health in and out of these uh, unprecedented times? Well, that's a huge, that's a huge topic. And you know, I've been doing some research, not only at, at, the, at the high school and at, across the country about um, students' mental health during remote learning and the stresses that remote learning and uh, plays on students um, and faculty and, and all of us, really. Um, in addition to that, the, the isolation of being, you know, behind a computer um, all day without being able to access the resources in the school, um, number one. Number two, what does, we? I think we're still going to find out the ramifications and the side effects and the effects of distance learning, um, because we know there's a very, uh, an, an extricable relationship between human connection and happiness and life satisfaction. And when we start to pull away from that, uh, those human experiences, we, uh, I think we run the risk of um, losing sight of each other as people. And um, it's, I think there's where that, that's for me, for me, that's really a challenge under, especially under these conditions. It's, it's always a challenge in, 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 in face to face learning, but the uh, remote learning experience really exacerbates mental health issues. So it's critically important. Um, we have at the high school a great uh, social emotional leader and uh, team of uh, counselors and social workers, which um, in many schools uh, don't have the, 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 the resources that we have here. It's now a matter of how do we leverage those resources so students feel they can access them in a way that they would be able to if they were in person. So we continue to work through those, but I, I believe that mental health uh, for all of us is, is in and out of these times is, is critical to, to not only academic success, but just uh, uh, just to be able to have some general life satisfaction and be um, productive member of society. So we again, that's a an issue that I want to continue to get better at and address and work on because we don't have all the answers, but we know we know it is an issue, and we have to continue to listen to find um, reasonable ways to um, address the mental health issues of our students. 
Mr. Fiato, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, mental health and substance abuse is something that um, we shouldn't be embarrassed about. And, you know, uh, to the, to the uh, young adults that are on this call right now, uh, once again, being 49, I can remember a time when there was a uh, uh, embarrassment when somebody uh, in a family that had mental health or had a substance abuse issue, something like that. Uh, and I think that during this time frame, uh, we're pushing the limit. It is dangerous that um, mental health and substance abuse is talked about more. Uh, once again, I keep to, I hate referencing the, the younger folks that are listening right now, but where you think it's natural and okay and normal to talk about mental health and substance abuse, which you're 100% correct, uh, some of the older folks or somebody who's been around, they're sometimes afraid by it. They, uh, they think it's uh, something that they must deal with on their own. Um, I can only stress that um, your generation and the people, uh, the young people of today uh, change that because um, we take our, 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 uh, our physical health. So, uh, you know, people take it is a very important piece. And I often bring this up that if, if somebody were to have an incident where they had a, a heart attack, people would be running to try to help. Or if there's a car accident, people are running towards those folks to try to help to see what they can do. When someone's having a mental health um, uh, breakdown or, or an episode, uh, people are afraid by it and they shouldn't be. Uh, we've really um, struggled, to be honest, uh, as a society to accept mental health as uh, something that should be talked about something that should be at some point be celebrated that we can have these discussions because if people are in a better way a better uh feeling about themselves and, the, and their surrounding uh their surroundings i think it's a it's a positive piece for uh the person uh individually which is most important uh the school or the employer or you know just people around you so uh, you know, I talked, I, I have two young daughters, 16 and 14, and they're very open. All their friends are very open about talking about things like this. And uh, I really, uh, it's, it's my hope from, from the mental health and, you know, substance abuse that uh, it'll be a thing of the past where it's not, uh, uh, it's not shameful to talk about. It. It's not embarrassing to talk about it, but something that needs to be talked about uh, because during these pandemics, a lot, there's a lot in life that can get you down. And these pandemics aren't helping, or this pandemic, I should say, is not helping by any stretch. So thank you so much, Tom. And thank you to our student speakers, Maybelline and Jada. And to Representative uh, Tom Golden and uh, Head of School Fiato. Uh, it's great to see our students in action and also your magical leadership uh, here in our community. And I'd like to pass it back to the talented Maybelline. Uh, fun fact about Maybelline, uh, she was the 2019 winner of the Lowell High School Jack Kerouac writing competition. So Maybelline, take us away. Hello, everyone. So we participated in a few projects that Project Learn facilitates, but for a fuller picture of their work and mission, check out this quick video. to Project Loom. Number five, Idea Camp. Idea Camp is a summer STEAM program. STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. Students learn about things like robotics, coding, and theater, or even food science, video gaming, and digital music. Number four, what next? Did you know Project Learn has given out 37,000 bucks in, to little kids in the last three years? Wow! Number three, commencement to careers. 40 student interns worked at 13 local businesses. Yay! Number two, early college. 300 low high students are earning free credit. Number one. 
So we're glad that we're glad work in action. And I'm going to um, turn it over to a really incredible board member, Patty Fleming Quigley, who's going to share a little bit more information about our fund to need. Honored to be part of the board. Uh, I'm a graduate also of the Lowell High School, and um, I'm super excited to be able to help uh, fellow students um, in at the high school and throughout the school system this year. Um, actually, I'm honored because I have one of the easiest jobs today, um, talking to you guys about donating. Um, I'm hoping that you see a, a link um, on the screen for to donate to Project Learn. Um, I feel like I don't even need to sell this. Everything was done earlier. Um, all the conversations uh, you heard about from Brian and LZ, the programs you talked, uh, you um, heard from a couple of the students. Um, um, I just think it's a great program. Um, and um, I'd like to outline a few different opportunities for you and your company that you work for too. Uh, so for example, for $5,000, uh, you can help 10 students get a paid internship for the summer. Um, um, you know, being able to give an opportunity like that to a student to be in a professional environment, learn about getting paid checks and deposits and, and taking a little pressure off of the families. Um, I think it, it's a great program to be part of. For $2,500, you can help 12 students. I mean, these numbers are amazing for the amount of money that you can donate the return on that investment. 12 students you can help get college credit at Middlesex Community College. An opportunity to be on a campus and as they said earlier, be part of a community that maybe their parents hadn't been part of um, and to get the opportunity to think big and think past for their future. For $1,000, thousand dollars you can help 20 students be part of the idea steam camp which is part of the middle school program um, and again more opportunities for kids that maybe they didn't have that um, if we if project learn wasn't around to help them out for five hundred dollars 50 students will get books and supplies for at-home learning uh, critical this year that the kids have what they need to do their work at home remote. $250 will help 20 kids. Kids Who Code is, is what the program is called and, it, and it's an after school program that exposes kids to all kinds of um, robotics and um, I'm sorry, computer coding and all of those things. A uh, hundred dollars, a hundred dollar donation will help bring five inspirational speakers to the career day at the high school. Um, and even if you can't donate, maybe you might be one of those speakers that could inspire some students or you know somebody in your neighborhood, in your community that would help help to be a speaker. Uh, $50 will bring brand new books to 20 young people. Even if you're interested in the internship and you have $50 to donate, that's fine too. But think big, think of what, what you can do to the, for the kids in this community um, and maybe what your, your business can help with as well. So again, I'm hoping that the donate link is somewhere on the screen. Um, and I'm just, LZ, honored to be part of the evening tonight. Thank you so much, Patty. It's always wonderful to have you part of our program. 
And, and like Patty said, there are so many ways to get involved and give, even if it's your time and being a career speaker, we're always looking for people who are in the STEM fields or in unusual things like air traffic control. Um, it really makes a difference. As, as Mr. Fiato said, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So that's the transformation we're trying to create. So now I'm really excited to thank all the teachers who applied for the Teacher Creativity Grant. This fall, there was a special opportunity for Lowell Public School teachers to submit their ideas and apply for a STEAM mini grant um, through our Teacher Innovation Fund. So this fund was designed to provide uh, grants of $1,000 to teachers with project ideas that demonstrate innovative teaching and learning in a virtual environment and or connect with Lowell Public Schools goals. So we're excited to announce four winners, uh, Jason McCreven and Karen Driscoll from the Washington Elementary for their geometry through programming. Students will learn to program Sphero mini robots and develop an engaging knowledge of geometry and they'll be getting $1,000. Patricia Adams from Lowell High School Freshman Academy for Remote Learning Science Labs, which sounds so cool. Students will be provided materials that allow them to conduct investigations at home while completing virtual scientific notebooks, uh, also for $1,000. Jennifer Shanks and Amanda Paquette from the Green Alge Elementary School for their Green Alge Design Fair and Arcade Carnival. This project will showcase the close relationship between art and science, which is so important. So thank you for this and a $1,000 grant for them. And Ralph St. Louis from Lowell High School to support Lowell Public Schools in developing plans and policies to support recruiting and retaining teachers of color, uh, which is such a big district priority right now. Um, and for that, he will get $1,000. So um, congratulations to all. And everyone here will be invited to join us in March for um, a Teacher Innovation Fund Showcase, which um, the teachers will each present about their programs and we'll get to learn what amazing things come to pass and how st our students are impacted. So now I'm going to hand it off to our chairman, Brian Martin, and Representative Thomas Golden to close us out for the evening. Interesting. I was just going to say, I always defer yep. to the coach, but I'll let, uh, I'll let the chairman go last. But uh, yep. once again, folks, uh, Project Learn, as you uh, had heard earlier, it's something that is so vitally important. It is uh, really creating that bridge um, for all of these students uh, throughout the, uh, the, the Lowell school system. I'm excited to be a part of it. I'm thrilled to be, uh, have, have been here today. But more importantly, um, getting the opportunity to really uh, dial in and, and talk with LZ and, and talk to Brian Martin and talk to the folks that are really involved in a day-to-day -day operation. Uh, it is something that uh, is truly worthwhile. And at the end of the day, uh, you see uh, two products uh, here that spoke today, the two uh, young ladies who uh, uh, I've had an opportunity to speak to them uh, at length, uh, but uh, it's really an exciting time to be in the city of Lowell, a part of something in the city of Lowell. Uh, Brian knows this, uh, this uh, attitude of can do uh, when, when presented with a challenge, the city takes it on, creates partnerships and makes sure that, uh, you know, the, the leaders of tomorrow are coming out of the city of Lowell. I'm convinced of that. I've seen it in the past and uh, very excited to be a happy, very excited and very happy to be a part of Project Learn. So thank you, LZ, and thank you to your uh, entire board. And uh, Mr. Chairman, off to you, but thank you for uh, everything you touch. You got the Midas yeah. touch, Mr. Chairman, you, you make it yeah. happen. Well, we've got, we've got a great uh, board of directors and a, a terrific staff and uh, some wonderful donors and a, a community that uh, is totally engaged in, in public education. I think uh, uh, it's what makes Lowell special. You can uh, walk to school from kindergarten to PhD. And I think that's one of our, uh, something special about Lowell. But I want to thank you and all of you who joined us tonight. Uh, thank you for your support and for choosing to invest in the future of Lowell students. As we close out tonight, uh, we'd like to make a special announcement. Uh, we're thrilled to have been selected to receive a 10-year 
sustaining grant from the Cummings Foundation in support of our STEAM out of school learning programs. It's a real honor and it couldn't have happened without the ongoing support for many folks here tonight. Special thanks to Jordan Elliott and Marty Cohen who did a lot of the work on the follow-up and we received $300,000 over 10 years. So we'll have $30,000 a year for our uh, STEM programs. Uh, I invite everyone to visit our website and learn more about Project Learn and go to contact me or anyone involved in the great work that we're doing. We're truly empowering students to learn today. Two of them that were here tonight. Geez, I, I'll tell you, I wish I was still at the high school with these two young ladies. They're fantastic. Uh, they're the new leaders, and uh, I think they were fantastic tonight. Uh, and finally, I'd like to uh, give special thanks to LZ for their great work as our executive director, uh, Jordan Elliott, uh, Sh uh, Shamir Rivera, uh, Marty Cohen, and special thanks to Shamir Rivera, who's leaving Project Learn. Uh, and accepted a job with the CBA and will be the operations director. Shamir has been a fantastic asset to Project Learn and we're gonna miss her. Uh, we wish her well and uh, good for CBA, but you're staying in Lowell, Shamir, so you won't be too far away. Uh, Shamir is a Lowell High graduate uh, and was just a star at Project Learn. So thank you everyone and have a great evening.